Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 61 of the Healthy Skin Show. In today's episode, I'm talking all about keratosis pilaris. If you're wondering what exactly that is, it's often described as chicken skin that appears on the back of your arms in the tricep region. But it can also appear on your legs, buttocks, and sometimes cheeks. And you might even think that you've got goosebumps that just never go away. Now, here's the thing about keratosis pilaris, and for short, we'll just call it KP. It's not really a skin disorder, like all of the other rash conditions we talk about, like eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, etc. What we're talking about here is really more a symptom of underlying issues. So we use it from a functional nutrition standpoint as a barometer of having some issues underneath the surface that we need to investigate because KP isn't something that will flare up and get worse. So there's three points to this that are very worthwhile in understanding if you have struggled with KP. The first is that you actually don't have a skin problem. You have a gut problem. And I know that for somebody new to this, they might be thinking, well, wait, it's on my skin. I'm going to the dermatologist. They're looking at my skin. And I understand that. But KP is a symptom of something else. And in fact, that something else happens to be vitamin A status. So when we show up with KP as a symptom, that typically tells me, as a clinical nutritionist, we need to double check what's going on with your vitamin A status. Are you in a optimal state or are you in an insufficient or deficient state? And here's the thing, if you're saying to yourself, well, you know what, KP doesn't really affect my life all that much. It's not that big of a deal. The reality is that vitamin A is vital not just for the development of your skin. It's critical for healthy thyroid function. It is very important for eyesight, which we all really need. And it's really important for healthy immune function. And there's recent research indicating that vitamin A that's coming in through the digestive system can actually help modulate gut flora. And so now you're wondering, all right, what do we do about this? Because if vitamin A is a problem, I'll just take more. But here's the issue with that. If you're having a vitamin A status problem, right? So if you're in a deficient state, which by the way, you have to figure out and I'll talk more about that in a moment, you need to consider number one, are you consuming enough vitamin A? And number two, if you are, then we need to question if you're able to properly digest and absorb fats. This is the third most critical point. So first of all, you have to have a gallbladder that will squeeze out bile in order to solubilize fat. You know, it's sort of like adding dish soap to a greasy pan in order to wash it. If you don't have a gallbladder, that's going to be a problem. You also need lipase, which are pancreatic enzymes that are specific for breaking down fat molecules. And here's the other piece to this. If you are in a state of leaky gut, so you have high levels of inflammation throughout the GI tract, and there's a lot of permeability happening, definitely if you've got GI symptoms or gut symptoms, but this can also be an issue for people who don't have gut symptoms because you don't always have to have gut symptoms to indicate that there is a state of permeability in your gut. All right, so at this point, you're wondering, what should I do? Now, here are the steps that I would recommend taking and investigating. First of all, you always want to get a baseline to understand where your vitamin A is right now. The test to get is the serum vitamin A, and optimal levels are between 0.8 to 1 milligram per liter. I'll put a link in the show notes to the blog post that I've written about the best skin tests to ask your doctor for. The next piece is to evaluate your diet for really good sources of vitamin A, things like cod liver oil and liver, rather than beta carotene, which can be very difficult for some people to convert to the active form of vitamin A. 
Next, if you haven't done this yet, I would recommend removing gluten from your diet because it has the capacity to increase gut permeability. We know this from research that every single person's gut becomes leakier with exposure to gluten. When your gut has lost its ability to return to a state of being tightly sealed, then we would consider that a state of leaky gut. But gluten alone shouldn't be the only thing that you focus on. You're also going to remove other allergens that you know of, and these would have been diagnosed by a doctor. When I say allergens, I'm indicating IgE response allergies that could, if they became so severe, result in anaphylaxis. If you have a lot of food sensitivities or an increasing number of them, this is a totally different matter. Yes, it's important to take out foods that you are moderately or severely sensitive to. That said, if that is something that's happening in your specific case where you're seeing an increasing number of sensitivities, I would highly recommend that you explore the possibility of gut microbiome dysbiosis or infections that are driving the sensitivities, the gut inflammation, as well as the leaky gut. These issues typically require more than just diet alone in order to resolve them. Now, as for what you can do regarding your diet, well, the easiest and most obvious answer is to increase vitamin A rich foods. Those include liver and cod liver oil, both of which give you way more than your daily value of active vitamin A. And after that, we've got some foods that offer a much lower amount, but could still be really helpful, such as king mackerel, salmon, bluefin tuna, goat cheese, and butter. Here's the thing with liver. It can be found in other forms. So if you're not comfortable eating whole liver, you could also look for it in forms of pate and liverwurst. Now, some of my friends like Mickey Trescott have helpful recipes to hide liver in things like meatloaf so you don't even notice the flavor. As far as supplementation is concerned, a vitamin A drop will be really helpful. And the reason that I prefer that over capsules is because you can really control much better how much it is that you're taking. I'm not a big fan of desiccated liver pills simply because you don't know how much is in there. And if you've got digestive issues, it would be better for the moment while you're going through this to focus on getting an amount that you can really control into your system. That's why I prefer the liquid vitamin A drops over the liver pills, as well as the larger dosages oftentimes found in capsules such as 10,000 IUs. And I cannot finish this podcast without heading back for a moment to talk about your gallbladder. Now, your gallbladder is an important, crucial piece to the whole entire digestion and absorption process of your body. If you don't have a gallbladder anymore, you really need some sort of fat digestion support aid for life that should always be taken about five to 10 minutes before eating a meal, not a snack as well as all of the supplements that contain fat-soluble nutrients. A routine digestive enzyme that you could easily purchase at Whole Foods or a drugstore is likely not going to be sufficient. A digestive aid that helps you break down fat must include ox bile as well as lipase. And yes, by the way, you probably did hear me say ox, and I did mean that, The bile in these products is derived from ox. There are no vegetarian sources because bile is not a requirement for plants to break fats down. So it's not found in the plant world and there are no vegetarian nor vegan alternatives. The only caveat to this is for people who have developed the alpha-gal allergy, where they cannot consume anything from mammals. In this particular case, you would not be able to take this type of supplement because of the ox bile, and you'd have to stick with a really good fat enzyme formula and work on all the other facets of your gut to make sure that you optimize fat absorption. With all that said, I hope that The one piece that you take from this entire podcast is that you really aren't what you eat. You actually are what you absorb. 
And so if you can't absorb thoughts appropriately, then we end up with symptoms. And the symptom of keratosis pilaris is inviting us not just to look at our vitamin A status, but could also be inviting us to look at what's going on in the gut. Now, if you've got any questions or thoughts about KP, head on over to skindrup.com forward slash 061 to leave a comment so we can continue the conversation. Take a moment to subscribe to the show and rate and review The Healthy Skin Show on your podcast platform of choice. And don't forget one of the most important steps. Share this episode with someone you know who has keratosis pilaris and is frustrated that they can't get it to go away. Hopefully this episode will provide answers to them that they might not be getting from their dermatologist or their family doctor. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and I will see you in the next episode.